Okay, we already have about 10 hand raises and uh, we will just go through one by one and uh, yeah, let us take a question from uh, Padampat Singhania University. Good evening ma'am, uh, I really like your session, I have a question. We are teaching in private engineering colleges, private university and when we have a diversified student, uh, students uh, who has a uh, you know good level of understanding, who has a uh, level of understanding which is very poor means uh, when that uh, students are diversified, you know how to uh, address those students first. Second, uh, when you are talking about uh, methodology adopted during teaching, I, I am actually teaching one of the course which is associated with our program that Cisco Networking Academy. There we have uh, seen that we use lot of simulation to lot of mm -hmm. uh, games, computer games mm -hmm. like Cisco has a Aspire games, our students design some games. So this kind of games also really help the students you know uh, to understand the things better. I was going through IT's networking, I was going through a paper uh, in uh, published in IEEE. Uh, they were showing that with a dancing model how you know people can understand VSI model better. One of my faculty also uh, was there uh, who actually understand this. Uh, one question I had in the morning I could not ask Fatak that there was IIT Bombay computer programming with MOOC model. Uh, we are really interested to join that, how to join that. Okay. This is one of the question was actually uh, for Professor Fatak if you can actually ask. And uh, um, like online program and model, you know, I have seen lot of uh, companies are also conducting some test. I was going through some material that um, Shivnada University is conducting some uh, test through Pearson View. Uh, conducting a test, judging a student, whether a student is good or bad or uh, what kind of gradation to be there for the students is really challenging. Sometimes students, this kind of online test like Microsoft, Cisco, they use dumps and get good marks. Sometimes some good students get bad marks or average marks. Mm -hmm. So how to overcome such things with MOOC model? So these okay. are my questions and these are my uh, discussion. Thank you. Over to IIT Bombay. I am Remote Center Coordinator Shubhrendu Gohanyugi. Thank you ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, there were several questions here. Let's try to address them one by one. And some of them were actually quite interesting. The first two, let me mainly address the first two questions. And the first question was about student diversity. And I think this is something that all of us can identify with. Many teachers, almost all teachers can identify with various types of student diversity like uh, starting from students academic background and preparation to their motivation to just their level of engagement that they bring into their classes and so on. So what is it that we can do? And while this is a very common question, it is also a really challenging one in the sense that there is no magic bullet here. So I can't offer you a single unique answer, but what I can try is uh, offer some suggestions as to what, what can be done to address diversity. And let's now, let's mainly take the diversity in terms of uh, students' academic background because motivational, motivational aspects is a completely different area and we can talk about that also. But in terms of students' background, it really helps for the teacher to know what the student brings to the class, what motivation, why they are here in your class. And if you simply ask them, they will say, well, it is a required class, it is a mandatory class and that is why I am attending the class. But if we try to go one step beyond that as to what they want to do in terms of their career or what their, what the profile of the class is, sometimes it might help to address real life examples tailored to the various backgrounds of the students. So you do not have to do each student every class but over say a month or so if you are able to, if you know what their backgrounds and interests are and you are able to uh, tailor some examples towards their interests. We have seen that students start paying attention because they feel that the teacher is paying attention to them. In terms of their actual diversity, the in, uh, diversity in academic levels is Bloom's taxonomy in fact gives us one framework for addressing it because what the taxonomy says is how do we set objectives and assessment questions at various levels. So our question papers are also, ha also have variety in the levels. So students, some, all students should be able to answer at least 
some of the lower level questions and some questions can be set as being more challenging. So at least if you have a variety and diversity in your questions and the objectives in the class, you have some chance of um, addressing everybody. And finally, I think we have to somehow bring everybody at least to some standard that we think is required for the courses. So again, uh, identifying which students are lagging and what to do for them, maybe some extra assignments for lagging students, maybe extra assignments for highly motivated students, all those are possible. More easy in small classes. In large classes, you can use learning management systems to do these additional assignments. Uh, but we have to make sure that every student feels that they are an integral part of the class and that we are doing something for them. Your uh, second question was games. How do we get, use games in learning? What are the benefits? And I'm glad to hear that you're using that a lot. Now, um, we have an entire session. I believe it's on day, one part of it is tomorrow and one part of it is on day five where we discuss how to use interactive visualizations like simulations or even games in an engineering curriculum. So you may get some ideas there on how to use them rather than simply showing it to students. And on the last day, we will also have a few sessions on how can you do some educational research in the sense, how can you measure what students are learning, whether their motivation improves if you use games. So there are ways to set up short studies and we will go over some research methods in educational technology. So that might uh, help you answer, the, I mean help uh, answer this question on games and learning. Uh, the question for Professor Fatak, what I would suggest is just type it in Moodle and we will pass it on to him because he will be the best person to answer that. Let us take a question from uh, Nyanamani College of Engineering. What about the rural background students, they are uh, very weak in uh, communication side. So we are facing the problem to teach in the technical oriented lesson. The language is the main drawback for our students. Uh, even though you, uh, our IIT peoples are uh, giving lot of options through offline mode only. So this is major uh, uh, disadvantages for our rural peoples. Right. Uh, especially they are, study, they are willing to study in engineering, but uh, the only thing is communication is very poor. Then one more thing, uh, they are uh, dominated by the township uh, students. So what kind of things we want to improve to improve the quality of the rural back students. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your question. Again, this is a very relevant and very challenging question on uh, how to address the issue, the drawback of communication, poor communication skills by some students. And I think I'm going to first say that there are two separate issues. One is a language issue and a language barrier and one is an actual difficulty in communication and the two are not necessarily the same. In the sense we have seen a lot of people who don't have language barrier and yet have poor communication skills or even if we allow people to speak and write in their mother tongue, they are still not able to communicate. So these are separate issues and uh, regarding the language barrier, I think the government is giving a lot of encouragement in creating ICT based materials in several Indian languages. So Professor Fatak mentioned spoken tutorials this morning and those have been dubbed into a variety of Indian languages. Many of the NPTEL videos also now are looking into aspects of translation and uh, language barriers and how to overcome those. And about uh, communication. So ICT tools actually do have some stated benefits in helping students improve their communication skills. We will go into details of those in one session tomorrow called digital taxonomy for uh, using ICT tools. But briefly what is done is students are given a lot of opportunity which is relevant to them in communicating. So communication is not just simply writing an answer on a test or asking a question. But for example, what we tell students is that 
uh, this is especially for third and fourth year students who are applying for internships and jobs, we tell them that they have to create a portfolio of the projects that they have done to show the, their potential employer or when they go for an interview. So for the portfolio, they have to create some way of presenting what all they have done. And because this assignment is extremely uh, personally interesting for students, it's their portfolio and their job interview, we have seen that a lot of people in fact do this seriously and this goes part way in, um, in addressing the communication skills. So collaboration tools that are uh, or collaborative activities in class are also known to help improve students communication because it takes away the pressure of the teacher being there and the teachers telling them to do something. Instead, they are just communicating with their friends, but they're still talking about technical issues. So group projects where students are responsible for some specific deliverables structured in a particular way can help students negotiate the various roles that they play. And again, we are do, going to do one session on group projects and collaboration and perhaps we'll try to address communication also within these. Let's take a question from Sridatta Institute of Engineering. Madam, my question is, which one is the best teaching learning methodology? Whether we can go for the traditional one, we can go for peer instruction, or we can go for say think, pair and share that uh, Professor Pathak last time he has taught us in the workshop. So these are, or any other method. One related question is there that say suppose if we are introducing these changes, whether the student community will accept those change hmm. or to what extent they will accept that one madam. Okay. Over to you madam. Okay, thank you. So this is a two part question. The first part actually has no real answer. The first question was what is the best teaching methodology and there is no good answer because it depends on your goal, the audience, the logistical constraints you have and mainly your goal. And even for a given goal, there may be multiple methodologies that are valid. So I would suggest don't think in terms of which is the best methodology. They're really, I mean, that, that's not a good question to ask. Instead, a better question to ask is, if this is our teaching learning goal, what is a suitable methodology? So for example, in today's peer instruction lab, you might, if you have gone through the activity constructor, it says if you, have, if you want to improve students' conceptual understanding, do this, this and this. Tomorrow you will see statements like, if you want students to design solutions to open-ended problems, TPS is a good solution. So sometimes direct instruction is also valid. So there really is no best methodology, but having said that, getting students to do something on their own, getting beyond listening and reading has been known to be good for the most part. So active learning, the reason we emphasize it so much is different types of active learning, in fact, can help different goals. And a student possibly can be active even in a lecture class, provided they have been given the opportunity to think of on that problem beforehand. So in terms of student acceptance, it really depends on how we phrase it and how we frame it. Sometimes we may find student resistance and at that point it always helps even before you encounter resistance, it always helps to tell students why we are doing this and what are the benefits, likely benefits. You may see a slightly slow acceptance in the beginning, but if your students see that Every third class there is one peer instruction question, they will get used to it very soon. So if we present it in a positive manner and if many of your colleagues start using it, the students will find that in every class in your college or in many classes they come across these active learning techniques and you won't find too much resistance in, uh, in those cases. Uh, let's go to Bhagwan Parushram Institute of Technology. Yes, ma'am. My question is that there are two students whose All India rank, one is whose All India rank is in hundreds. Okay. Another, which is, who is in a normal engineering college, whose rank is in lakhs. Okay. But for, but for both of them, 
course curriculum and timings are same mm. i am very strong uh, supporter of the, this ict approach but uh, in this uh, short duration of time for the normal student it is quite difficult to complete the course uh, contents in this time so yeah. either there should be more time or there should be uh, less contents so the question is you know what to do if we have to complete a syllabus in a given time and especially for some students or i would argue that for all students completing a given set syllabus in a given set time is not realistic and not even meaningful because what we are looking for is how much students have learned we are so we should be less concerned about the breadth of the number of topics that we tell them so again this is a difficult question because of constraints if you did not have too many constraints so let's say you are an autonomous university you can decide along with your colleagues you can set your syllabus and curriculum in such a way that the number of topics that you deal with is manageable for your given audience ultimately what we want is for the students to learn deeply each topic to whatever level we specify if you think that you can give students extra time or ex extra time for assignments and all if you have that freedom do go ahead so in some institutes this is possible and i i would urge all faculty to take advantage of this uh, this flexibility of course you have to make sure that the following courses which depend on this course are not badly affected so that's why this is a dialogue that an entire department or an entire institute has to have together now if you don't have such flexibility let's say you are teaching something and the university paper setter set an exam then our hands are tied to a large extent and even then in most universities there is at least some part which is let's say 20% of the course grade is with the teacher and you can try these innovative teaching methods or deep learning deep teaching strategies in for that part if your students are willing to do some extra work that's also another option post them online you don't need to uh, be with them face to face all the time so you have to exploit both the time and the flexibility to as much extent as you can to get your students but i mean th this is really a sad problem and i think we all agree that it's not right to tell students that you have to learn this fixed amount in this fixed time um, i think professor fatak is trying to make some policy changes also in this regard trying to give students get students to do the same amount in in a larger time and so on okay uh, gl bajaj group of institutions good evening ma'am ma'am what are the research opportunity possible in uh, education pedagogy for engineering background students okay so the question is what are the research uh, opportunities for uh, engineering background students in pedagogy or educational technology and i'm going to yeah. answer this a slightly different question first and then i'll come to this question uh, the slightly different okay. question i'll pose first is what are the opportunities for engineering college teachers and the reason i pose this question is that each one of you is actually in a very unique position because all these new teaching methods that you are trying on your own or that you formally and systematically learn in this workshop and wish to try you have a lab at your disposal in the sense your class is your lab you can try some teaching strategy you can implement it and then you can actually do a study by gathering data systematically by analyzing it and also writing a research paper based on it we run a conference called uh, technology for education it's an ieee conference runs annually and we'll give you information about it later in the workshop so in that conference in fact we have several college teachers doing such studies and uh, submitting papers it goes through a peer review of course but there is an opportunity now if you ask what are the opportunities for students in india it's still a little limited because there are a few places which have masters programs in educational technology where students can do such research there are even fewer iit bombay happens to be one of them uh, places which have a phd program in educational technology 
However, there is a lot of opportunity in say the e-learning companies waiting to hire these graduates. So many institutes now are thinking of uh, starting M.Tech programs in education technologies and I think the number is only going to grow in the next 5 or 10 years. G.F. Garda Institute of Technology. Uh, good evening madam, this is Professor Bharatesh Danwade. Uh, my question is that on uh, PI, mm -hmm. uh, basically this PI is used to check the um, correctness of the outcomes which, has, which the teacher has designed uh, or it is it has some objective a purpose uh, to uh, full proof uh, make the full, uh, full proofing of the design of the uh, the outcomes design okay so uh, again this is an interesting question so let's explore the question is what is the role and purpose of peer instruction strategy is it to check if the teacher has taught such that all outcomes are met or is it for checking how many outcomes, how much outcomes the students have uh, achieved and PI strategy actually has the advantage of doing both. It is in a class of teaching strategies which are called as formative assessment and the word formative means is that the role of the assessment, it's a, it's a question posed to students so think of it as an assessment. But the role of the assessment is not to grade students and not to rank them, not to say that these students are good and they pass and those students are poor. But it is to get feedback both on the students learning and on the teachers teaching and act on the feedback. So when we do two rounds of voting, what students get is feedback on their own learning and their own understanding and their own misconceptions which they can correct right away. At the same time, as a teacher, if I see that despite two rounds of voting, most students happen to have the wrong answer, wrong multiple choice, it's feedback for me as a teacher that I didn't teach that unit properly and I have to do some other technique. So peer instruction actually serves both these roles for the teacher and for the learner. Mepkosh Lenk Engineering College. Hello madam, good, good evening. Uh, madam, uh, I like a clarification in uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, we have create and apply. So when we say, when we ask the students to write a program, does mm. it come under apply or create? Yeah. That is one question. Yes. Another okay. question is, uh, what exactly is the difference between objective and outcome? We say outcome based education and all. What we normally do is that we give a set of objectives and then we also give a set of outcomes. So what do you suggest madam, but uh, so far you have talked only about objectives and uh, that of course comes like an outcome only, these are my questions. Okay, so let me take the question, the second question first, uh, what is the difference between objectives and outcomes and uh, the thing is we have only used the word objectives and why so and this is a slightly grey area in the sense that different people use different terminologies and different uh, definitions. So suppose there is some governing body like AICT or somebody who says that these are a list of objectives you must meet and these are a list of outcomes. That is suppose somebody already gives you a definition, please go with it, okay, because there are said, this is really a matter of terminology between different uh, groups, different communities and so on. The reason why we are not making a distinction is because at a conceptual level we consider both of them to be very similar to each other. At most we can say that the objectives are for your course and for uh, a topic that I will teach tomorrow, it is domain based and so on and the outcomes are more generic that students must develop uh, the uh, skill of teamwork. So those can be put under outcomes, some people make a distinction between domain based specific versus more generic skill based. But um, there is no really good, unique, accepted difference, especially because these two are very similar in their purpose. My uh, suggestion to you is, it does not really matter if you are not answerable to anybody for whether this is an objective or an outcome. Because finally we are looking at the learner's performance and something that is measurable. If on the other hand there is somebody who says hey here is a difference and you need to write both the objectives and the outcome then please go ahead with that definition. It is not like a textbook definition where something is very precisely written 
that this is the difference. And the first question you asked, the create versus apply. So again, you have to go back to seeing what the student needs to do. So suppose we say we tell a student uh, write a program to add the first 10 integers. So you have to think beforehand what all steps the student has to take mostly at a mental or cognitive level in order to answer this question. At some level we are factoring in the students prior knowledge and background because is it that we already have given them some sort of algorithm to doing it and they have to simply go and code that algorithm? Have we asked them to write the pseudocode beforehand so they know exactly the steps? In that case it would become more of an apply level. Or, or on the other hand if we have to, if the student has to think about some large system, break it down, make lots of decisions and write code for an entire, to build an entire system, the same act of writing a program now becomes a create level activity. So it really depends on what are the cognitive tasks that a student has to do in order to apply or create. So you, it, it's not a single generic answer, but what is it that the student is doing with respect to their prior knowledge. Okay, School of Management Sciences, please go ahead. Uh, my question is regarding active learning using peer instruction. Mm -hmm. It is very unclear to us how we are going to complete it, what is its aim, and how we are going to be the facilitator in the classroom for the students for this kind of teaching. Uh, let me just try to understand your question. Are you asking how to complete the assignment or how to do it in class? How we are going to complete the assignment and uh, what are the roles we are going to play in the classroom? for this kind of teaching methodology? Uh, so a quick answer to the first part of the question, how, how you are going to do the assignment. There are three phases. First is you understand what peer instruction is. For that you go through the lesson. Uh, there are videos and there are short questions. You have to do that and then you will have an understanding of what peer instruction is. And you already have been exposed to peer instruction during this workshop. In the next phase, what you have to do is, you will have to construct your own peer instruction questions. For that, we have given a constructor, an activity constructor, and we'll also upload the PDF file that the activity constructor is referring to. So use both of them to create peer instruction questions for your topic. So you already started with learning objectives of a topic. Choose the same topic and see where you can introduce peer instruction. So uh, there are multiple types of peer instruction questions. So choose any three of them and create, complete the assignment. So this is all regarding the assignment. So regarding actual class implementation. Yeah. So assignment, I think the deadline is about a week or so from now. Uh, there was one announcement I had related to this. So maybe this is a good time to say it. In the beginning around 3.30 we got a few questions as to what to do in the lab and essentially in each lab what you need to do is go to your lab and open Moodle and there will be a, a module called lab for day 1 pm 1 and it's going to be in order. So just find the module for that particular day and that particular session, click it and then there will be instructions within. So these are carefully structured activities that are in Moodle. Today's lab assignment, you, uh, in order to complete it, various parts of it, you have another week to do it. The other part of the question, what to do as a teacher? So peer instruction strategy for a teacher has two, uh, two tasks really. One task is to write the question suitable for a particular goal and the second task is to implement it in the classroom. What the assignment today helps you do is to create various peer instruction questions for various teaching learning goals such as improving students conceptual understanding, getting students to make uh, to relate different representations such as a graph and an e equation and so on. Once the question has been created by you for your class, then when you are in your class with your students, you can implement it in the same way that we did here. You pose the multiple choice question let students vote, get them to discuss, maybe make them vote again, 
give them hints on their reasoning, the focus is on reasoning and not on the right answer and finally summarize that activity. So each PI question usually takes between 3 and let's say 7 minutes or so to complete. It can be as short as 2 or 3 minutes also. So this is part 2 of what you do as a teacher. Okay, uh, St. Xavier's Catholic College of Engineering. Good evening madam. Our management is focusing 100% result for the students. So in this context we are not able to fix the setting the objectives exactly for the students. So what is your suggestion in this? Kindly correct me if I'm uh, mistaken. You wanted a strategy for 100% results in your college? So when you teach, as you told, that is uh, setting the objective and moving towards in the hierarchical way is uh, preferable and uh, uh, will be effective. But uh, moving towards the 100% is a result, your system, your suggestion may be ineffective. But we cannot concentrate on the 100% is result. Our motto is only 100% is result. But uh, as per your instruction and setting objectives first, and moving towards the hierarchical way of uh, preferences, uh, it will be less effective for the 100% of the result. The goal of setting your courses or uh, creating your course, designing your course according to revised Bloom's taxonomy is not to get 100% result based on some arbitrary norms. The goal of revised Bloom's taxonomy is, so firstly it is that various tasks require different amounts of cognitive effort by students and as teachers we all intuitively and informally recognize that. So this hierarchy tells us, gives us a theoretical basis of how to, uh, how to tag a question, how to label an objective as a lower thinking level or a higher thinking level. What we did not discuss today is how many questions should we set at lower levels, how many at higher levels and so on. But our goal is that students might start at a lower level or in a mix of levels and we want them to at least go up the ladder and we want some questions to be at the higher levels otherwise, so if you only ask questions like define something and write a short note that is not engineering or science, that is not learning. So Bloom's taxonomy help us define what it means to have meaningful learning in a given topic. But it is not a formula for getting 100% result and um, yeah, that is all I can say. D.Y. Patil Institute of Engineering. Yeah, this is Rashmi Deshpande. My question is again regarding hierarchy of cognitive levels of learning objectives. Uh, we, while deciding the parity, we saw six levels of Bloom's taxonomy mm -hmm. and then in the activity that was conducted later, we tried to assign one learning objective per level. But what my understanding is, in a single session, it is not compulsory to have one learning objective per level. I mean, it depends on the content, depends on the syllabus. For some sessions, we can have or say we can address three levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Maybe in some other session, we can access all the six of them. Is my understanding correct? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So the comment here was that even though we have six levels within Bloom's taxonomy, it is not necessary that one session, let us say one class or one unit has to address all six levels even though in the exercise we did it. The reason we did it in the exercise is to see how much you can push the cognitive effort and co thinking of a student without increasing the number of topics. That was the purpose of the exercise. But you are absolutely right, within a given session it is up to the teachers, uh, it is up to your course design that you create. Is it a single level that you are targeting or is it two levels? Maybe it is levels 1, 3 and 5 today and tomorrow it is only level 4. So all these combinations are possible but it, all these combinations are possible at, a, at the details level. But if you take your entire semester or entire course, what is recommended is that there is a variety of objectives at different levels. So do not create a course and do not create an exam question paper which has only recall and understand level of questions. That is a yeah. general uh, uh, recommendation but otherwise what you say is absolutely right. 
Sagar Institute of Research and Technology. Uh, my question is, uh, in computer science uh, area, there are some subjects like compiler design or uh, TOC, theory of computation. So it is, we are finding difficulty in uh, creating its learning objective as well as Bloom's taxonomy application is uh, difficult in such numerical kind of subject. So kindly suggest some methodology. Okay, so the thing is usually, the question is there are some subjects where uh, it's difficult to write objectives at all Bloom's levels. This is a question sometimes we get. Uh, you also said that it's difficult to write learning objectives. So that part is actually not valid in the sense whatever be your topic even if it's very descriptive there is always some expectations we have from a student and if you think about what you want to see the student do in front of you so imagine you are conduct you are talking to a student and you are free to ask anything from the student and the student is free to show anything what is it that you actually want the student to demonstrate to you that is the learning objective so it's not a valid statement to say that it's not possible to write learning objectives. Now in courses where there are calculations and applications of rules, it should get, so you said when you said it's numerical, my understanding is that there is some rule which is then implemented into some numerical equations. In such courses it should be even more easy because you want students to demonstrate the application to calculate something numerical. If you, so, the first part is learning objectives are always possible to write and the way you do it is actually just asking yourself the question what do I want my student to be able to demonstrate in front of me after say one semester of this course. Sometimes people say that it's not possible to write learning objectives in all six levels and even there. Um, most of the times we have found that with a little bit of thinking it is possible. So once concrete practical suggestion I have is look for use Google and see if people have actually done this course in terms of learning objectives. These days when since outcome based education is becoming very popular a lot of courses are being rewritten in terms of course not the course uh, content but the course design and the course uh, outlines are being rewritten in terms of learning objectives and see if anybody has created learning objectives for this course. Rangasamy College of Technology. Uh, good evening ma'am. Sir, uh, this is Ramesh from KS Rangasamy College of Technology. Okay. Uh, madam, uh, we, are study, uh, we are teaching different type of problematic subjects to our students. So which ICT tools can be effectively used for simplified learning to our students? Uh, I am sorry, I didn't get which course you are teaching, you said? Civil C engineering ma'am. Civil engineering. Yeah, so the use of ICT tools actually is, is not restricted to a particular domain. And one reason we are using more examples from computer science and electronics here is because of the demographics we have among the participants. A large number of participants are from these domains and that's why and our expertise is also in these domains and that's why we are using these. But use of ICT tools, creating learning objectives, this is possible in any domain. So what we can do right now um, during this workshop is and look for examples that we have in terms of learning objectives and assessment questions from various domains that we have already created and we'll pose them as examples in Moodle. And in terms of using ICT tools, you should look at the purpose of the tool. So if you look at peer instruction and especially if you are going to use clickers, the, the interesting or the irrelevant part is to create a clicker question, this peer instruction question that you can use. And in tomorrow's Digital Blooms taxonomy session, we will see that a lot of these tools can be used in uh, any domain. What is important is the instructional strategy and the ta task or activity that students do with this tool. It's not the tool itself that's restrictive to the domain. Knowledge Institute of Technology. Good evening, madam. Yeah. I'm Prabhakaran, faculty of mechanical engineering of Knowledge Institute of Technology. I have a one-day one question. Mm -hmm. 
is it possible to set objectives which includes all cognitive levels for a undergraduate program okay so the question is is it possible to set objectives at all levels within an undergraduate program the short answer is yes and i elaborate a little bit more most of the times it's possible to write objectives at all levels even within a single course even in introductory courses because the higher cognitive levels do not mean that we bring in more content or more sophisticated content it is that given a certain topic how what are the different levels of thinking that we want our students to do so for example in a first year first semester programming course you may think that design is out of the question but it is still possible for us to get, give students a project where they design a game using a drag and drop interface like scratch that's possible for even high school students or school, middle school students to do so possibility always exists and it's within the four year under, undergraduate program it's really up to you as a department to decide to what level you want to take each course so sometimes people might say that i only want to target some levels in the first part of the course in the first level of the course and next semester i want to target other levels that perhaps that can be done but try to address different levels within a single course perumal uh, the thing is that uh, you have told about the ict tools right uh, so could you please give me give us the a brief description about the ict ict tools so that it will be effective for all the teachers to use that in the classroom okay the question is uh, can we give a brief description of ict tools and let me just go back to explaining what we mean by ict tools so ict very broadly speaking is information and communication technology that includes almost every technology tool that we use today the most ubiquitous one being the computer and the internet what we will do in this workshop is give you exposure both from a learner's perspective and from the teacher's point of view to a sample of these tools so for example moodle that you use today is an ict tool when you used avu avu is also an ict tool avu poll can be considered as another tool google docs is an ict tool so there are several hundreds if not thousands of ict tools and we we'll look at a few of these which have relevance in teaching and learning uh, one common or very uh, important and common tool that we will look at is interactive visualizations because in science and engineering topics it has a, an important role to play and there is no single listing available of all the ict tools that exist but uh, at the end of the workshop you'll be able to make a list of some tools and some instructional purposes related to them okay kurukshetra university like my uh, my question is that uh, like uh, to design this different methodologies like peer instruction tps so for, uh, for a teachers perspective it is okay but the real uh, problem comes when it comes to the motivation of the student hmm. so like most of the time uh, the students uh, like which are taking admission in the engineering colleges the quest is not that like to learn engineering so how to keep motivate them throughout the four years uh, that is one question the second question is like in a semester hardly uh, you get 40 like 40 hours or 40 lectures per course so how to exactly manage the time while implementing this different teaching methodologies thanks uh, i'll take the second question first because that may be a little easier to answer even though it doesn't have a many of these questions you are asking are challenging and real in the sense that they don't have a textbook answer but it's still worth talking about it and this la the second question you asked was that we have 40 hours in a semester for a course and if we want you know how do we manage the time how do we do a break up of time and especially if we are trying some new teaching methodology to what how much weightage should we give it so if you are using a new methodology we are not saying that you must use it in every class and you must use it for the entire class in fact that is something which is perhaps a bad idea to do 
what we are doing here is that uh, so if you notice any session especially in the next few days we'll always start with and focus very heavily on the purpose of a particular activity or a task or a teaching methodology so if you know that the goal of this teaching method the intended goal the targeted improvement is for is something next time you are faced with a scenario where you have the same goal you can use this strategy so for example when we want to tomorrow when we do visualizations we will see that when you need to when students need to look at uh, how different parts of a machine move visualizations are important so next time when you are doing some intricacies of the machine instead of explaining it on the blackboard you might choose you might ch choose to look for a video or an interactive visualization so once you have a grip on for this goal this strategy is a good idea you can choose when to implement it and how much so i'll give you examples of what people do here typically in one, in every lecture we have at least one but usually about two active learning techniques some may be as small as a 3 minute peer instruction question sometimes it's a 15 minute think pair share question sometimes it's a 6 minute debate but there's between one and two active learning strategies that's what some instructors do some instructors entirely go the flip classroom route which we'll look at again so different models exist based on the instructor's purposes and goals uh you are right that how do we manage to complete all the syllabus and do these active learning techniques and uh, there is no good answer there either cut the content for which you are doing delivery that is possible because usually if you do one active learning strategy for a given content you don't students learn a lot more than just that content so they will be able to do self learning on some other parts of it the first question you had on motivation of students um that's in fact a more harder that's a harder question that you ask and i think i'm only going to give a very personal answer here uh i think it's our responsibility to on two fronts one is find out what students want to do they are all there in engineering because they think it will help them get the good jobs so let's try to relate it to what the workplace needs that's at the second end so if at the workplace students or the people who go to the new jobs if they are required to do uh, group work and work on design thinking we should train them in those communication is also one important aspect so through our technical uh, courses we should also look at some of these generic thinking skills and other such workplace needs Uh, you will find other people giving you lots of different answers all of these are valid because this is a very hard question but at least let's find out what is the motivation of students and it's okay if they don't want to learn newton's third law or second law of thermodynamics sri narayana gurukulam college ma'am using uh, the tools like this a view classroom uh the i think the very advantage is getting an expert from around the globe okay so uh, have you uh, like uh, iit and uh, the iit people have initiated something for the not for the teachers teachers they have already a program uh, for students yeah uh, and the one more thing if if is that is the situation uh the every people will be going for the best uh, teachers around the globe how uh, okay. that may be a problem in the future so okay so let's actually let me just pass through your question and the point is with the availability of internet and avu and all these technologies there is there are a lot of uh what content available and we are, we think this is a good thing it's not a problem and the reason we think it's a good thing is that content is not the same as learning information is not the same as learning and content is not the same as learning so in the past days you used to have a library full of books and every teacher wrote another book and so on uh it's like now books and content is being created using technology media 
what is important now is to help our learners assimilate this information, understand this content, be able to judge which information can be used and applied in what way and that is the role of teachers today. 30 years ago teachers were the only people who were experts and who had the information. Today information is there everywhere, good information is there. So let's, our role has changed. So there is no threat here at all. The main advantage is uh, we can break the barriers, the geographical barriers. So the, the objective of this workshop is like uh, our students are there and we are very, pro uh, we are, suppose we are uh, uh, the it's teachers from the right. campus only, that is uh, uh, home tutors, yeah. like campus, in the campus only. So uh, these are the, the you, are, you, you will be discussing about the tools that can be used in the class itself for the better understanding. Is it so ma'am? Yeah, so our focus is on use of tools for either better teaching or better learning. These two, these are two faces of the same coin. Our focus is not on just the tool itself, but the point of why we are using the tool and how to use the tool for better teaching and learning. That's going to be the focus of this entire workshop. So we will select a few tools and we will look at several effective research based, uh, research proven effective instructional strategies in order to satisfy this goal. Okay, so with this let's actually formally end today. Uh, this has been a very interactive and interesting question and answer session. I hope uh, this was useful to you also. Okay, thank you and uh, good evening to all of you.